Hello, friends. This is Mike Williams. I recently had the pleasure of interviewing songwriting legend Mike Stock. Mike is an English songwriter, record producer, musician, and member of the songwriting and production trio Stock, Aiken, and Waterman. He has written and or produced 18 number one records in America and the UK, over 100 top 40 hits, and is recognized as one of the most successful songwriters of all time by the Guinness Book of Records. In the 1980s and 90s, as part of Stock, Aiken, and Waterman, Mike holds the UK record of 11 number one records with different acts. And in the UK singles chart, he has written 54 top 10 hits, including seven number ones. And so without further ado, here's the conversation with Mike Stock. Now, Mike, what I wanted to do, uh, we talked a little bit before I got started with the show here. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about the whole process of songwriting. And, and nobody knows it better than you do. And when I was reading your bio on your website, and by the way, folks, it's MikeStockMusic.com. It says that you got started and began writing songs at the age of seven. Yeah, that is my recollection. Uh, they weren't very good, Mike, so uh, we won't go searching them out. <laughs> <laughs> the first song I wrote was uh, called The Thunder and the Lightning, and you can guess why. <laughs> <laughs> that particular event moved me to write a song. No, so I, I was keen on doing it, and I can't ex explain why exactly. I don't know who, nobody ever pushed me into it. But I do remember seeing American movies about Tim Pan Alley, and uh, I remember one particular uh, s film about a guy who wrote a song called Any Umbrellas, a very old song, I don't know if you are. So I, I, I love all the old music, and he sold that song for half a dollar or something <laughs> back in 1910 and you know every, everyone in the world was singing it I was fascinated by the thought that you could just as it were from nothing from like dig up a piece of clay and make a pot and sell it to someone for a fiver you know that that's that fascinated me and I if I could write a song on a piece of paper with uh, you're not damaging much in the world you've got some paper off a tree but <laughs> you've created something else so I, I, I sort of planned when I was that sort of age, I, collect a, I collected 60 of my songs in a folder that my mum had um, right way through my sort of successful years. Um, she'd dig it out every now and again and show the relatives. But yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I started and uh, I don't exactly know why, but there you go. Okay, so okay, Mike, so when you were writing the songs, was it um, guitar bass, piano bass, both? Both really. We had a piano in the house. I, I never had music lessons. Um, my brother, my older brother, who recently died, but he was classically tra trained, and he he was the lead viola in the German National Opera Orchestra. He left England after going to Guildhall School of Music, and went over to Germany to, to ply his trade because they there's a career out there for classical musicians more than there is in England. So there was music in our household. Um, and for his training, my dad got a little upright piano in the back room. And so I plinked and plonked on that and taught myself. But I, I picked up the guitar, first of all, and just, I think, like everybody I know, who got a Beatles songbook and learned the chords. Right, right. And I really chose that to accompany me singing them, you know. But then I got, got on the piano and, yeah, so at the time I'm sort of 18 or so, I'm quite good, reasonably good, you know. So, so in your bio, Mike, you mentioned that uh, being self-taught has its advantages and disadvantages. So what are some of the advantages of being self-taught versus the disadvantages? Well, for example, if you asked me now to play one of my biggest hit songs, it wouldn't matter which one it was, I couldn't do it. I'd have to go to the piano or guitar and work it out again, remind myself what I did. Because if you're a, a trained musician, someone said, well, here's the sheet music, play it, you know. So that's what I can't do. I'd have to go and relearn my own songs. And, and, and with other, if I do covers of songs, I've had quite a few hits by doing other people's songs, I have to learn it by ear. Um, and and if you asked me to play one of those, no, I couldn't. I'd have to relearn it. So that's the difference between me. And, and my brother, of course, could read music. But what I found with him was when I wanted to, him to jam along with me, he, he couldn't. He couldn't jam along. He'd say, well, where are the notes? I want to read the notes. <laughs> it, it works both ways, you know, so I'm not that bothered. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, and, and with writing your own music, Mike, um, you mentioned that you had to, you had to, 
remember your songs. You had to go back and maybe refigure them out. What did I do here? What did I do there? And that's something myself that I have have come across. Um, What happens with me is I will write the song, I will record the song, and then it's behind me, and then I move on. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a misconception out there that people believe that once you've written something, you're going to remember it forever. I mean, Mm -hmm. you're going to remember key components of the song, but you do have to go back Mm -hmm. and get a refresher Mm -hmm. and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember this is what I did here. Exactly. I mean, sometimes I forget my lyrics like two weeks later, you know. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's always quite embarrassing because if, if, if I'm in a gathering where there's music, musical instruments, they all say to me, go on, Mike, play us one of your songs. And I was like, I, I, you know, you can't, I'd have to rehearse it. I couldn't possibly just do it, you know, anyway. Yeah. Now, now Mike, from age seven, then you move forward in time and then you, uh, you got together and you formed a band. Yep. Yep. And did you spend a lot of time playing cover music or was your inclination more to get to original compositions that was my inclination and my my aim and and my love and desire but you had to earn a living so i I had i had a a band but we had two names we went out uh, if i i got gigs in um we have a sort of a pub circuit in london rock pubs you might call them where there was music live music and they would expect to hear um you know either rock style of music or original songs from a band they wouldn't expect to hear fly me to the moon or you know the ladies a tramp or night fever from the Bee Gees, which is what you'd want to hear if you were having a wedding or a social function in one of the hotel ballrooms so i had two band it was the same band but we had two different names when we did the hotels i played all the disco songs the dinner music whatever else they needed and charged them and we're going back 40 years or so now, um, yeah. uh, you know, 500 pounds an evening. Uh, when I did the rock pubs, we got 60 quid between us. And um, what I couldn't have is the manager from the hotel walking around the corner, seeing us in the pub in jeans for 60 quid, and then me expecting him to pay 500 quid the next night to be in the Dorchester. So we, cha- we had two names to hide the fact we were the same band. But, we, but therefore I cut my teeth on uh, the, the American songbook, you know, the old songs, uh, the British uh, classics, as well as, you know, r- r- all through the Beatles and and the disco era. That's what I played. When you write what? songs, Mike, um, what's the process like? In other words, does the music come first? Do the lyrics come first? Uh, do you have moments where you have these, these dry spells where it doesn't matter how much you want to write a song? nothing emerges and other times obviously where you have these spurts of uh, creativity and you can just write the songs on the spot but for you in general how does it work Uh, well i mean i could be flippant about it because what nowadays there's an old quote from one of the classic writers uh what comes first music or the lyrics he said no the check (laughs) so (laughs) somebody, somebody commissions you to write a song which is the way i've done it now for the last 20 or so years 30 years you know somebody says i need a song by wednesday for this artist or that act so i i'll just get down and do it but as it stands i've got it here where is it this is my little uh, um digital dictaphone thing there's 160 snippets on here of ideas that i have and i sit down at the piano every single day and a music a melody will be in my head or and i've got a pad with titles lyrical titles um, so I, I'm ready at any time uh, with a bunch of ideas, but so and there is no lyric first or music first. You know, it could it could even be a drum beat comes first. It could even be uh, a, a, a circumstances, um, you know, a news item. It, it, I really don't know. Um, I, I think because songs are broken down and, they, and you have to get into the detail, I might start more often with a title. I know what the song is called and then I will set up for the payoff. So if I know it's called, uh, as one I did with Rick Astley called Never Gonna Give You Up. So if I say I know it's called that, I wrote the title up there, Never Gonna Give You Up. What does that mean? So we'll start off in the verse and we'll tell a story and it will lead you to the payoff. 
which is the title. So that so you you can start from a title. Sometimes I start just from a uh, a melodic phrase that tickles me somehow. You know, so it can be anything, a million ways. And I think if you're going to do, I mean, I've written hundreds and hundreds, possibly more than a thousand now. I don't know what the number is. Um, you've got to get inspiration from from everywhere. You know, you have run out. You, of have, you have moments, you have Mike, when Mike, you're right, asked right. to to write a song and um, where it's not coming together and you think to yourself, oh boy. Um, no, I think I've, I've got close to it on a couple of occasions, but I've never walked out of the position where I'm saying I'm writing a song and not come away with something. I've never actually not done it. Um, some, it's harder than others. Some, it, sometimes it, it just comes, you know, right. you, can't stop, you can't stop it. Um, there's just a flow going. The idea is just working. Um, but uh, no, I've never not done it. If, if I'm saying I'm writing a song today, I, I will write one, you know. Okay, so... <laughs> it might take me a few days to, to, to finish it. I might start off and get a bulk of it done and I'd have to come back to it, but you know. Now, when you do this, Mike, are you doing it uh, mostly on your own solo or uh, are there moments when you're collaborating with somebody in order to bring the song together? Well, where, in, the, in my collaboration with uh, Stock Aitken and Waterman, um, w Wart, in that um, arrangement, Waterman wasn't a writer or musician. Um, he was our business end of, of our collaboration. And that's really important. You can't have a hit without some connection to the business that you're, you're getting that right as well. Which is why it's so difficult, right? You can write the best song in the world, but if it doesn't get heard or it's not in the right place, you know, you're... Uh, so, my, but my writing partner was Matt Aitken um, in that circumstance, and normally I'd come up with the basic start of a song. I'd probably get the first verse and chorus, but then having to write the second verse, and the artist is very often we work in five or six artists a day. So sometimes I'd be saying, Matt, can you go over there and come up with an idea for the second verse <laughs> lyrically, you know? Uh, and so we would collaborate in that way. Um, most of the time, I've just finished an album for a an English act been around for donkey's years called Fizz. They were called Bucks Fizz and they had to change their name. But the um, the process is um, one of the band members writes a song, I write five or six, somebody writes one and that's that's how we've done it. You know, but I prefer to write on my own now. Okay, so okay. and then when do you think Mike when what moment in time would you say that you really hit your break? So you you're playing the clubs and then something happened where you're thinking, okay, I could maybe make something out of this as far as a career goes. Well, my, this is, uh, I, I don't like to say, I hope it doesn't come across too badly, I'm immodest of me. Or I always believed I would. I had an absolute belief that I could write hit songs and be successful at it. Um, and I probably had been successful at writing hit songs before anybody else knew about it what i didn't have was a way of getting them out there properly getting them to an audience getting them to a release getting them properly produced properly finished off properly mastered properly packaged up and sold that's what i didn't have and i was playing in my band and we were doing very well and i could have carried on doing the function circuit you know playing at weddings etc i could have done that all my life and bands band members did you know i know people who did do it all their life but i always thought i i need to cut away that safety net uh and one um new year's eve uh i told the band we were playing at the um one of the london hotels um that is the royal lancaster in london in the, and i said look guys this is it. I'm not taking any more gigs. I'm going down. I built a studio under my house in my cellar. I'm going down there. I'm going to produce some records and I'm, I'm giving up the gigs because I, I want to move on. Um, and that was um, December, end of December 1984. And in January, I had this idea, which Matt Aitken came with me because he was in the band as well. He said, I'll come along with you. And we took it to Pete Waterman. It took a month. You know, I cut away the gigs and suddenly you, you put your effort and your belief into your future uh, without any safety net. And within a month we were teaming up. And the first thing we did 
in uh, first thing we actually did together was in February of 1885 um, and then we had a hit sorry I've got I've got all the blooming years wrong here haven't I because it was 83 <laughs> that I got <laughs> up the gigs and we had the in and in January 84 we made the connection and in uh, and then in February we we made our first uh, top 10 or top 20 UK hit and then the next thing we did was top five a song we'd written and and then the next then we a few follow-ups up with after that we had the first number one um, which we recorded in 84 but got released early 85 so so about getting confused over the years there <laughs> oh that's okay uh, it happens yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah 83 uh, at the Royal Lancaster Hotel New Year's Eve I said the band were giving it up I'm giving it up I'm going in the studio and within a month um, we, we'd got it started okay so when you went to Pete and when you connected with Pete was he familiar with uh, with your work, Mike, or did you have to show him what you had? Well, because I'd been a writer trying to get arrested um, for a few years, um, Pete had Pete. Pete was a manager, and he was the manager of a, another producer called Peter Collins, and he'd produced Musical Youth and Nick Kershaw, two artists that were successful in the UK, and also produced a song that I'd written. Uh, um, so he knew me as a writer when I walked in to, to speak to him with this idea that Matt and me had put together. Um, and it, so he had the connections, I thought, because he'd managed a successful record producer. And as luck would have it, he'd split up with him and was looking for some kind of a new collaboration. Uh, so that, that's how these things work, I suppose. So then how does the process work, Mike? Um, you're writing these songs now. You've got connections into the music industry. How are these bands or these artists connected back into you or how are you connected into them? How does that work? How does the process of finding Mike Stock as a hit songwriter, how does that happen? Well, I suppose after we'd um, teamed up with Pete and we had... Uh, we decided we made a choice Mike between us we had a plan um, and I knew I put it together with um, Matt and I presented it to Pete and Pete's famously dyslexic and didn't learn to read when he was young and he wasn't able to read the plan he said Mike don't give me this it's like a car manual I don't understand it <laughs> what we have and it, what we actually chose to do was find a marketplace that was under exposed and probably undervalued and this was the club dance marketplace back then in 83 and 84 uh, there was something called Northern Soul and Boys Town which was the club scene quite active in the UK uh, and in that you'd, you'd create you know there'd be it, it there would be a club and a DJ playing records. If you if he played something that the crowd didn't like, they'd leave the dance floor. So the DJs were hot about understanding what pleases their crowd. So we checked it out. We realised what it was and we started to give them material of that sort. The thing that we did differently is we, we produced it better. We were looking at improving the quite is most of it was quite cheaply done but it was these clubs were packed and you know you've got you know that the normal route to hit record is via radio that's what people were aiming at radio wouldn't have touched dance music with a barge pole they, they hated it yeah, they, they looked down their nose at it we thought well actually when, when a radio dj is in his ivory tower putting the records on, spinning the discs on radio, he hasn't got instant feedback, he's no idea whether the audience likes it or not. If you're a club DJ, you lose your job, you know, you've yeah, chucked, yeah. You've kicked people off the floor, you, you, you don't, don't bother coming back. So we had to give records that people would like and the DJs would like, so we managed to um, kind of inveigle our way into the hearts and minds of the DJs and the clubs and we made records that suited them only my aim was to put rather than just 
pointless disco we were we were we were, i wanted to put songs on top of the beat and things like you spin me round we did and things like it had some hazel dean songs which definitely aimed at the gay clubs but spin me round had a more general attack and you know but they were for people to dance to as well as sing along to and whereas before you couldn't really sing along to, to much of it it was quite a noise, but it got people on the dance floor and they were very loud with the cowbells, which set off their sound to light systems. So you'd, they were all flashing drums so the lights would go, you know. Um, but that was only for us the, the strategy to get us through the door. Eventually, radio started playing what you would call dance music. We started, so You Spin Me Round got to number one in the UK. And so the BBC was forced to play it on their chart rundown. Um, and then we, we sort of knocked the door down. Then we removed the um, removed the wooden frame of the door and then the bricks one by one. So there was no wall at all. <laughs> and we instead of getting people to follow what we were doing or for us to follow trends, people started to follow what we were doing and started to copy us. So that's that's really. But I mean, this is a long story, Mike, because it, and it takes us through for 10 years and we we ended up. Um, splitting up, uh, uh, you know, Aiken and Walsman. Well, Aiken walked away first of all, and then I stayed on with Walsman for a couple of years. But it, it, the the industry closed us down. The industry said, "We're not going to allow you to take so much market share." We were taking twenty eight percent of the UK market share. That's just three guys in South London, you know. Yeah, it's interesting because <laughs> as you're telling the story, Mike, I'm thinking to myself, you actually created. Um, a genre yeah I, I think so yeah in a way right and uh, you did it in an organic way yeah exactly and I was just going to ask you because you're, you're leading into it that had to impose upon the overall music industry's agenda as to what it is they were going to play on the airwaves Absolutely. it was okay to be in clubs yeah but it's a whole it's, a, it's another discussion to take it to the radio waves absolutely and but before i get there though how did you how did you break it in with the with the djs in the clubs did, did you take your your songs to them and say hey could you play this what do you think about this how did that work no i i matt and me went uh, once to a particular club um to get a get a flavor of what was going on i didn't stay very long and i didn't like it one bit <laughs> Um, but I did see the point and I realized that, um, this, you know, it's youth, uh, people between the age of 18 and 30 have an awful lot of energy and music seems to be part of anybody's diet to, you know, to a certain degree. Um, whatever you do to the music industry and the way they have done what they have done to close people down this doesn't stop people's love of music they'll still find it somewhere and so this sort of club music was frowned upon it was definitely club 1830 and um but they were the ones with disposable income and with energy to enjoy it so um we used to laugh at um you know, it's all, you can imagine, I mean, Mike, I'm, I'm going to say this, you, you might not agree with me, but the Beatles were a dance band. The Beatles, that's what they did. Look at the crowds, look at what they actually did. Playing in the Hamburg club, that was just nightclub setting. Right, right. When and that's what they did. You know, Mac show, Mac show, make, put a show on, get, get us all excited. That's all it was all about, excitement. Um, radio, by comparison, was so stayed, uh, so safe. Um, and we just we just realised there was another world out there. All they what they didn't have were polished records. Slightly they were slightly cheaper. They were just chucking them out any old rubbish as long as you had a drum beat on it. You know, so we thought we could just do a better job. And it was a marketplace that was under exploited, under loved. Um, so we thought we could. And you know, it was a tactic that worked. So you created a market. Yeah that was overlooked or untapped by yeah. the, the music industry. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, they weren't so expecting it. <laughs> but as soon as you poke your head up the, off, off the parapet, you know, they take aim at you. <laughs> they didn't spot us coming, Mike. We were through the door before they realized. 
And then once they realize it, Mike, then I'm assuming they try to get some level of control over you and your songwriting team, um, your production. Yes. Uh, I I was I was approached by um, Matt Matt and I were approached were um, by a a successful recording manager who tried to poach us away from Pete Waterman, uh, bribing us with our own fantastic studio and our own and sort of other inducements, um, which I absolutely said no to. Um, and I even, I made notes, I looked, I made notes on some pads that I when I write lyrics. I was writing this song and it was sort of describing this about trying to drag you away from someone, uh, break us apart because then you could be divided and one thing or another. Um, so I just, and I'm a very loyal person, Mike, you know, I've married to the same woman now for nearly 50 years. And my, my, my youngest son works with me here in the studio. My oldest son works for a news agency. Um, I have grandchildren and we're a family unit and we've kept together. If I'd have taken this person's offer you know, we wouldn't have been where we were. I, 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 looking back, and at the time I felt it was just an attempt to break us up. Right. right. And that was really at the beginning. It was after our second hit. It was really at the start of it all. Um, but, but, but we didn't go along with it. But, but suddenly, with your head above the parapet, making music, so we were being blocked everywhere. Contrary to, if you ask record uh, people, industry people in the UK now about Stock Aiken Waterman and they would tell you that we got loads of help from radio and the media. We didn't. The only time we got played on radio was in the chart rundowns when they had no choice. We had no coverage. A little bit later we got coverage because radio started to spread its wings and it wasn't just the BBC. It became it was a, a radio station called Capital Radio and we they loved us because we were the sound and they're, they're slogan was the sound of a bright young Britain so we were, that was our music and they championed us but that was a bit later on but that that actually maintained our growth and extended our career somewhat because the BBC would have shut us down immediately. Now you did have um, an issue with the radio industry yes where you mentioned before that um, you ran into some issues with them and you had a, there was a lawsuit yeah, I sued. I, it's the BPI, which is the British Phonographic Institute, which is the governing body of uh, UK music. Uh, so I say governing body, but I, I joked with the chairman and said, well, where'd you get your authority? He said, well, we were founded in 1940. I said, no, you weren't. You were founded in 1970 something, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, it's you know, but they, they, they would. It's, it's like proving your authority because you have some provenance, you know, some history that goes back. Um, and, and Mike, just to get the calendar right, this was um, in in 1994, after Stock Aiken and Waterman had split. Suddenly, I have a number two in America. So I'm on. I'm on, well. Matt's with me. Matt Aiken. We have a number two in America. We have number one in the UK, uh, on our own, of our own bat, if you like. I set up a new label, and I'm off and running again. And um, the chairman said, "We're not going to let you do to us what you did to us in the 80s." And 90, I said, what do you mean you're not going to let, let me do it? He said, well, we can't allow you to do it. I, I, I looked at him in the eyes. I said, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> How are you going to stop me if people buy the records? I found out what they did, and they virtually ruined me. Um, and they can do anything they like. So they ripped. So we, we, we were following up a hit single, um, which was number five over in the UK. And... Um, Follow-up comes out and it stalls at number 41, which is the graveyard, because radio will only pick up records in the top 40. If you're at 41, no, it's invisible. Why did that stall at 41? I call the, uh, uh, you need to know, that the charts were shifted around in the early 90s to, to basically to block Stock Aiken and Waterman. Suddenly, it wasn't an honest poll of people's record buying habits. They, they used to use Gallup and Mori, these are old pollsters who collect data, 
and they would make the charts out of that. Well, in about 1992, they formed uh, a company called Millward Brown, which was the joint between CIN and Millward Brown. CIN with a BPI, Chart Information Network, had a joint venture with a pollster, and they got the data, they sent it to CIN, and the CIN Chart Information Network presented the chart that the majors wanted, not the chart that the public wanted. And it, I, I've screamed about it because the BBC was saying, this is the most accurate chart, the fastest chart, it's the accurate chart. You could, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't accurate at all. It did not reflect taste. Uh, it was a carve up. So I had that argument with the chairman of the BPI and he told me he was gonna block our efforts I sort of challenged him to do it, and the very next record stuck at 41. And when I called CIN, CIN and said, why is this record at 41? I know I've done this many copies. He said, well, you're, you had formats, so you had a CD and, and a, a cassette back then, and possibly a piece of vinyl, a 12-inch. You were allowed three formats. He said, well, you had an extra format, at, format out. I said, I didn't. He said, yeah, you had an extra format. I put me, well, didn't. And then he said, well, your cassette, your barcode wasn't working on the cassette, so they may have been bought the shots, but they didn't register at the tills. I said, they did register, because I have, I'm clever. I was a clever to their games. I said, I've always had my own barcode tester, and I run it through. Here it is. I have my barcode test and put my seat. Yeah, it works. Um, but they said, well, we're not, we, that's, that was about... Um, 60% of our sales because we we're going to a young market who loved cassettes at the time so that they were discounted that put us at 41 and the very next record I put out was going in the chart um, at somewhere around seven or something I get a call at lunchtime on Sunday by somebody who works at the chart who said your chart your record was going in at top 10 but we're putting it down to 20 because we don't like the sales patterns you don't have the sales pans. What do you mean the sales pans? Well, somebody went into a shop in somewhere and ordered 20 copies. So, I, you know, I sort of had no idea what they mean. The next record that goes out, they don't even bother putting in the charts. They just pull it out totally. It's not even appearing in the top 200. Why have you done that? Well, somebody went into a shop in Sheffield and ordered 27 copies. So I put on the front page of the Music Week, which is the weekly paper for the music industry, a £10,000 reward for the person to find me who bought 27 copies of my record. And there were no takers. I then got a so, lawyer. So they're accusing you of stuffing sales? Yeah. Is that what, they, is that what well, they're accusing I, you of? Well, I don't know. I don't, on that particular issue, when they failed on the barcode, when I said I'd check my own barcode, they, 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 they moved it to, you were sending out a team of buyers, is what yeah. it was, to go into shops and buy them. Now, normally, if they're clever about that, and I, I, don't, I don't know how it works, I, you, I assume you wouldn't go up and ask for 27. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're doing it, you're trying to do it dis discreetly. But some bloke all just asked for 27. And the worst thing was, according to the report, from the chart people, when questioned by the shopkeeper, he said, yes, I'm trying to hype the record into the chart. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so, you know, it doesn't matter what, the, the, you know, the truth was, I was not hyping any record. Right. They, right. they were just finding some excuse to, to blame me. And so I called their bluff and said, well, if you can find me the person, maybe the shopkeeper at the till they can find the person, I'll give him 10,000 pounds to name the person who it was. And there were no takers. And realizing that I sued them. I got my lawyers onto it, had a meeting with the BPI's lawyers and the chairman. Um, they stuck to their guns. Then they said they raided a lockup in North London and had collected 100, uh, 1,500 copies of my single, this particular single. Uh, which proved that somebody had gone out and bought them and stacked them in a lockup. You know, a lockup I've never heard of, or I don't even know where it was now. Um, so I had, I had a meeting with them. I said, "Okay, you're telling you're telling me that I bought those records, or I organised to have those records bought. So who do they belong to then? They belong to me. So I'll turn up at the meeting and I want those fifteen hundred records there, and I'll take them away with me because if I paid them, I own them." Right. So when I got there, they didn't have them. There wasn't 1,500 records anywhere. 
All they had was one record in a plastic bag, in a Woolworths plastic bag. So this is a sample. I said, no, my record looks like. Where are the 1500 you confiscated? I'd like them back, please. You said I bought them. Anyway, a few weeks later, because I'd sued them and they got nervous, they had another meeting and they said, Mike, can we just, we'll destroy all our evidence and can we just move on from this? So uh, in the end, I agreed and said, look, forget it. Because I had many other problems at the time, Mike, because my new studios, I was number one in the UK, I was number two in America, had just made these records and it had been undermined by the London Underground. <laughs> they were putting in a new Jubilee line extension and they weren't supposed to come underneath me. I found myself suing London Transport. So here am I, not only suing the BPI, but I'm suing London Transport. And then I was trying to get my copyrights back from Pete Waterman, and I was Matt and me was suing Pete Waterman. <laughs> so I was stretched wow. so so thin. I, I moved on with the BPI. Eventually sold that building that had been undermined, and I moved on. Um, but that whole period from about 1995 to 2000 and four or five, I was just fighting battles. I mean, they stopped me. They completely stopped me in my tracks. Uh, and it was all organised, really. They, they can organise anything, Mike. I was so occupied with people suing me and me suing them. <laughs> and it cost me, you know, a million pounds just to put some legal actions together. And, yeah. You know, and All because, uh, Mike, you didn't play ball, really, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All because I didn't play ball. And this is what people don't understand is they can jam you up and uh, legal action is one of their aces up their sleeve. They can tie you up in court yeah. with litigation. Yeah. It'll cost you a lot of money. And it gets most people to the point where they say, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I can't afford to do this anymore. I've got better things to do. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mike. And the, po the point was when suing Pete Waterman for the copyrights, what Pete had done in the meantime had sold them to Warner Chapel, Warner's. So I thought I was suing Pete Walsman. When we end up getting into court, we're actually suing Warner Chapel, who have extremely deep pockets. Yep. Um, and so the barrister said to me, well, we're going to go into court now. It's, go it's going to be £90,000 per day. And this is go going to go on for weeks. £90,000 per day. So at the end of a week at trial, I said to the barrister, we can't afford to go on. I said, so let's, before judgment is entered let's withdraw our claim and leave it like that so the matter's not been resolved but i wasn't going to have a because um, we weren't going to win with warner chapel with warners well and they were at the time time warner so you know this is a massive a global organization we couldn't possibly win so um we withdrew our action and no determination of the ownership of that was ever made. Um, and I, I'm not gonna go into it now because Pete Walsman and I have patched up our lives and we're, go, we, we, we're not enemies anymore. But that's, but as you say, that's there are ways to entrap you, ways to divert you, ways to block your passage, ways to do anything they want to, if they determine to do so, you know. And it's just a little old me. <laughs> but Mike, you still had a, a tremendous uh, you had tremendous success, even with all of these obstacles in your way. Were there ever times when they approached you and they tried to lure you into their machine? In other words, were there moments where they tried to get you to play ball? Um, Mike, I, I think I know what you're getting at, because this, this is one of the things that uh, n now I know something about, but at the time I didn't. Although I was asked to go along to, on one occasion, um, the way it was put to me was um, a, 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 one of our sort of hab habitual routines uh, after a day in the studio at 10 o'clock at night, Matt and me or people would go down the pub for a pint just to relax. Um, and so we went down and on this particular occasion, I don't, I can't even tell you his name now, I couldn't remember. He was just introduced to me by Pete, he was a stranger, but we got talking, having a laugh in the pub. Then he said, Mike, you want to come up to, we've got a hotel that we've got, we use. Um, it's a weekend, get anything you want there. Um, girls, boys, drugs, it's not a problem. It's a great weekend, everyone loves it. I said, 
Sounds a bit dodgy to me. He said, I don't have to worry about that. The head of the Metropolitan Police will be there. I said, <laughs> sounded, like, <laughs> sounded like a script from Monty Python. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't think, because actually where it was was uh, up in the north of England. Uh, and I didn't want to do that. So I said, no, uh, politely. I, looking back, I, what I know would have happened, I mean, sex and drugs and rock and roll, who cares, it's the music industry. That's the way it's always been. I, you know, wasn't my life, and I knew, but I knew that's what the, the story was. The thing that got me was, once you're in a situation like that, and you do take part in something, they've all, and you've witnessed it, and they've witnessed it, and it's all been, you're theirs. You're theirs forever. They've got you're compromised. You. Yeah, absolutely. And that whenever they call you for whatever they need doing, you've got no choice. So that's why I said no. And I, I, the lesson I learned long before I made it in the music industry, my wife and I used to drive a battered old car. And it used to really break, let us down a lot. We had it parked outside a flat and some bloke who had a bit of a shady background said to me, tell you what we can do, Mike, we can pick the car up, we leave the keys in it, we'll take it away, we'll dump it in the river, nobody will ever find it and you claim the insurance. Bobby and, I, Bobby and my wife, we said, well, I mean, that might might get us out of a few problems uh, and then I said Bobby we can't do that that person will know for the rest of our lives we've committed an insurance fraud right and uh, you know if I ever do make my name in the music industry you'll be knocking on the door <laughs> very quickly um, no you can't do, you can't compromise yourself you can't do that and that that's a, I remembered that lesson when uh, when thinking about this so I'm not going to do that so I never, and I never did, and I don't believe that I was ever approached again. Um, although I did find out the power they had when they wanted to pull me down. You know, they can do it in other ways, Mike. But now, yeah. did, did you ever sense, Mike, that uh, even though that you didn't connect into them, you didn't play their game, that they still needed you? I mean, they they still needed your talent, right? Because there were artists that were coming to you mm. that needed hit songs. Yeah. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Do, do you ever feel like, well, you've had a lot of success. I mean, you're, you're very, very accomplished. But do you ever think to yourself, well, there's a ceiling. In other words, I, I cannot penetrate beyond this point. Mm -hmm. They won't allow it. Mm -hmm. I've got to operate within this range here. Anything above that point, mm -hmm. Mike Stock is, can't, can't, you know, can't play here. Yeah. Um, some of the artists I've worked with have broken through. I mean, uh, Kylie Minogue is a girl, you don't know her in the States, but she played Glastonbury last year. She did a big set there, went down really well. Um, obviously, um, somebody like Rick Astley goes out on tours, he does very, very well. Some of our acts have lasted many, many years and, and keep working. Um, at the time, but of course, they are, um, they have managers. I never dealt with their managers. I only ever had a one-to-one -one with the artists. So Rick Astley comes in, his manager's over there somewhere, they're doing the deals. I don't want to know about that. We're singing a song here. This is how it goes. You sing it, we get you out of the way, we finish the record. That's what I did for years. Uh, all of the artists, I had a relationship with them one-to-one, -one, but not with their managers or with their various record labels. You know that. So whatever else went on, Mike, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. that's that, what I meant, uh, Mike, when I said that um, they still needed you because you were still generating, yeah. and delivering hits. Yeah. But you personally, yeah, from your personal perspective, did you feel like, hey, I've I've hit a ceiling. They won't let me above it. As an example, based upon what I I read at the beginning of the show here, you clearly have more number ones than Paul McCartney. Mm-hmm. Yet. He has superstardom. I will never be superstar. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to be Mike. No, okay. we, you see, Paul Paul McCartney sings his own songs. He doesn't have to write for loads of other people like I do. He only sings his songs. And in a way, that makes him that restricted him because I could I can still write for a sixteen year old girl. It doesn't bother me or a young band. You know, it doesn't bother me. I'm not singing it. I don't look foolish. But I think Paul of or Billy of late looks a little bit foolish. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't sound very good. And you know, uh, you know, some of his recent albums, some of the stuff is just horrible. 
you know, that's all I can say. And this is a, this is a guy I love. But but yes, you're right. Glastonbury, the, the the doors are open and have been open for so long for for him. Right. Yeah. It's it's interesting um, going to Paul or Billy. I'll refer to him as Billy. I know you're familiar with the whole Billy Shears piece of this. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have asked me personally, why is it that he's still out there? His voice is shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is coming from a guy that uh, you, you and I, Mike, spoke before we got started here um, about how much the both of us were uh, loved the Beatle music. Mm. I personally like the Wings period. Mm. I know some people don't, but I did. I liked a lot of Billy's uh, mm. Wings material. But he's still out there. He's going to be uh, 85 this year. Yeah. And he's still pumping it out. I mean, do you have any thoughts on yeah, I do. why that might be? I do. And in, in common with um, the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, they're all of that sort of age now. And so uh, this is, it does bother you. It does bother me completely that he's wrecking. I don't want him to sing those great songs anymore, personally, because he's ruining them. He knows he isn't delivering them. Um, does he need more money? So they can't, it can't be that he needs more money. But people need more money. The people that are controlling him, the system that's got him in the grips that he's in, need the money. They need to pack out Glastonbury. They need all the theatres, all the, the venues that he's doing. You know what? I think if someone said, we'll let you out of your contract now, Billy. Go and have a lie down and stay out the rest of your life and have a nice time you know he'd take it like a shot because touring permanently on tour the guy is tiring it's stressful and he's not delivering the goods so it can only be that he has no choice yeah i would agree with that so he's got something there contractually yeah i'll let the audience decide what that might be that's keeping him in the game at a point when he shouldn't be there anymore yeah he, he he's he uh, says, or according to reports, he's a billionaire now. So he doesn't need the money, but it's the other people in the machine they've got going that need the, you know, I don't know how many Beatles reissues they're going to be, but they're going to, they've just done get back the film. There'll be, there'll be another one around the corner. This is such a money spinner, such a cash yep. cow for all these people. They can't have him retire. <laughs> You've got to keep going, Paul, you know. Uh, it's a shame, but it's torture, I think. It's got to be very, very difficult. Yeah. It, it has to be. One of the things, Mike, I wanted to ask you is, um, because I get this a lot, many people don't understand that um, song credits can be assigned to somebody who didn't write the song. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, how that process works? Well, I, look, you, you, you can, <laughs> these days, uh, I was astounded to see on certain artists that there were seven writers or in some cases even more. Now, how did that work? So who gets a credit as a writer? Well, if you were in the room when the song was written, you can get a credit. Or if you said, I'd like this drum fill over here, or it doesn't matter, or you've added a word, thank you, here's a credit. Um, you know, I tried to track the Lennon McCartney earlier Northern Song stuff, and I can't find the trail on that. With me and my songs, they're all registered under my name or whoever my co-writers were. And the PRS, the royalty flow, flows obviously to me uh, and doesn't go off in detours. So um, you can say anybody actually wrote the song. Nobody, nobody actually has to ever go there. And to, and to some degree, I've credited Pete Walsman with all of our songs and he, he didn't. But we were a team and we agreed to do it. And I shook hands with him in 1984 that we, right. was, we would split everything. And I've stuck to that. Um, How about artists, Mike, though? How about artists that you're not, uh, you're not in collaboration with, you're not in partnership with, that uh, would you have a song that you wrote, that Mike Stock wrote, that contractually is being credited to an artist that, had nothing to do with the song. In other words, it's just, it's eye candy. It's, it's to give the illusion that this artist is writing songs, but when in fact they did not. Um, I've shared copyright on that basis. Okay. Reluctantly. 
Um, okay. Um, particularly on a name names on that. That's okay. That's okay. But, but you know, there are there are famous artists, a couple of famous artists, where I agreed to share the writing interest with them because they had a publishing contract and their publisher was going to give them a, an advance as long as they came up with a commitment of so many songs. Um, and you know. The things that go on, Mike. You know, it's just—it's a business after all. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not moralising on it, um, because you know you do what you have to do at the time. Uh, but the the example you gave of people taking credit for something is who who didn't deserve the credit is is it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Okay. And how about Mike? You work with so many artists. Have you seen an evolution of artists where at one point you can look at an artist and say, this person has talent, whether musically, vocally, and then over time, see a degradation where that criteria of having some level of talent really doesn't matter anymore, mm. that they can just fabricate whatever they, mm. whatever it is they want to fabricate. Mm. Have you seen anything like that? Because I, I'm talking from my own personal uh, perspective. I have seen that as I'm watching the, the music business and the various <laughs> artists going back to the 1960s when I was a kid. And but you being in the business, have you seen that as well? Um, it's not important these days. I think. I mean, you, 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 yeah. What do I mean? Everything is visual now, so you you better look good. It doesn't matter what you sound like because we can fix that very very easily, and we can make you sound like a robot. That's what most of these modern recordings sound like. They put them through vocal tuners. You can sing any series of notes and we'll put them in the right order. Uh, producers will. But, but you know, back uh, when I was working in the 80s, we didn't have that. So if a singer was going to sing in tune, you had to work on it. And, and it was a sweat. Uh, and they had to have talent. Um, so you don't really need that anymore. And, and, you know, I can think of, I mean, there are marvellous examples, Mike, of how it used to be. Um, Frank Sinatra, you'd stand in front of a mic, a big old mic, and behind him is an orchestra, and Nelson Riddle's done the arrangement, and it's a live take. Yeah. They, wax, they wax a hot one there and there in front of your eyes, that, and Frank will sing, and then he'll step back if he's going to project too much, and the orchestra comes in a bit loud, and then he steps forward, and it's all a dynamic experience of people who knew their trade and knew how to deliver it and I don't know anybody like that anymore that's all gone um, and you need a you need a video on YouTube or wherever you, you so you, it's all about the visuals the optics you've got to appear to be something you're not actually that anything like that we know what deep fakes are like these days it's difficult to tell um, yeah so I think that t talent has been degraded uh, and the, the music industry has lost its way. They will need, they will need, um, they have to keep it going, but it's not as important anymore. That they, 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 can, they can obtain their societal, you know, their, their social engineering ambitions through the other methods. Right. Uh, the internet, you know, people were saying for me for years, where, when, when are we going to find the new Beatles? All the way through the 80s, and who's going to be the new Beatles? And they kept saying it in 1995, and I said to the chairman of the BP, I know it's the internet. The internet is the new Beatles. That's where kids are now. Ev eventually, he said, yeah, everyone tells me that, but no one can tell me when. I said, that's, if you're asking when, you're already too late. It's like when you go home and your wife's had a haircut and she, she waits 20 minutes and says, what do you think of my haircut? <laughs> you, <laughs> you've already lost it. You hadn't noticed. It's happened without you even realising. And the internet, which absor music used to absorb people, you know, kids back in the day when we were teenagers, when I was a teenager, you waited for the next record. You couldn't see the Beatles. I never saw Elvis Presley, except on a film occasionally. You know, you didn't see him. You had to hear it. And you fell in love with the sound of it. So the, the people who made the sound had to be really good at that. Nowadays, everybody can be seen. So that's taken over from the sound of it. And, and it's the internet anyway, because we were competing in the late 80s with video games were starting to come out. And we could see the writing on the wall. That was taking teenage pocket money. You know, and, and uh, eventually... Uh, everybody's got their iPhone, everyone's stuck into that. That's the new Beatles, and that's how they're engineering society. 
they did it through pop music before and now they don't need to right, right. now let me ask you about um the use of studio musicians i know you know a lot about this and um i have um said that uh, the Wrecking Crew model was, was very prevalent, not just here in the United States, but it, it existed everywhere yep. in, the, in the UK and so on. How prevalent is the studio player or the studio musician in pop music versus people believing that the actual band on the album cover yeah. was laying down those tracks? Well, <laughs> I doubt that that's probably happened on very rare occasions. It's, in fact, it's a nightmare. Whenever I had to do a band, I just had to get rid of them quickly and Matt and me would finish it off. Matt and me were probably, talking about the Wrecking Crew, or the, uh, I've played uh, keyboards, bass, string arrangements, brass arrangements, drum programs on more hit, hit records than anybody because Matt and me were the musicians. Um, so, and if I was a production team, I wouldn't want a half-baked drummer <laughs> taking up a week of our time trying to get the drum track right you just wouldn't do it it's because it, you can't waste the time and um, there, there, there's there was a, a apocryphal really frankie goes to hollywood trevor horn great producer trevor uh, they there was we all listened to the drums what, what great drums they were and somebody told us it took six months to get the snare sound <laughs> you know and when we looked into it, it was a Lin 2, you know, straight out of the, the box. But these are the things that get talked about in the industry. How did you get that? How did you get that? It's all done by people like Trevor Horn, uh, brilliant uh, producers. Uh, you know, I'm struggling to think of a band, actually, uh, of the past 20 years that really play everything in the studio. Because going out live, you can bluff it like mad. And most of it's not live anyway. Biggest surprise to me was when Stevie Wonder mimed. I saw him in London and he wouldn't go on because he'd lost his Sinclavier program uh, discs. And um, I saw Michael Jackson miming uh, at Wembley. Uh, th he's, the thing is, Paul McCartney doesn't and he should. He's the one yeah. who should. <laughs> um, because, because Michael Jackson did the dance routines and everything, you can't sing that accurately and do that dance routine. So it's all faking it one way or the other. I don't think people really mind. It's not really, it may be an eye opener to some, but uh, you know, I'm only waffling now, Mike. I don't really know the answer because I just made my own records. Yeah, no, yeah. it's fine, Mike. It, it's making perfect sense. I went to go see uh, Foreigner in concert oh. going back a number of years ago. And it was their 40th anniversary uh, tour. And uh, when I was there, I'm watching the show and, you know, being a guitar player myself, they have these big screen TVs and I'm watching the guitar player playing the guitar sound that I'm hearing out of the speakers and it doesn't match up. All right. So as soon as I saw that, that, of course, piques your interest. Yeah. And now you're looking for everything. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, I think they got maybe two or three songs in, and it was I was the, the person I was with. I said, "They're miming, they're they're lip syncing, and they're miming." And uh, I left. Oh. I left. I, I just oh. I couldn't deal with it. You know, it's uh, it was a moment. It was uh, a moment in time when you come to this realization yeah. that uh, this belief that you had yeah. about these artists completely comes apart. It falls apart. You know, and, and like they will go to great lengths to try to fool you that it's live. I remember Michael Jackson even had a pre-recorded howl back on the mic. So he picked the mic up and it whistled, you know, you get a howl back. And go, Ooh, you know. Everyone was convinced, therefore, that what was coming out was what he was... <laughs> that was just pre-recorded. We've done, I've done it on a couple of live shows that I've, I've back in tracks for people who are going out live. You, you've got to make it look live. You've got to you've got to play it for all it's worth. Um, and, and the truth is, nobody can really reconstitute live what they recorded in the studio. It's it's, it's so detailed and so, you know, j just the effort that's gone in to get it right. You wouldn't risk it live if you had any sense. Yeah. yeah. I have a friend of mine who's out of Germany and he's a professional sound engineer. He's been in the business for decades and he's passed along some work that he's done. And I can't really talk about it because 
have to keep it confidential, but he was talking to me about live performances and uh, how they are completely remade uh, post-production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, mm. down to the audience, everything. Yeah. yeah. And so you get a before sound of, of what this sounded like and then after, and it's just night and day. Yeah. So many times when you're buying these live recordings. You're not. No. That is not what you heard that day if you were no. there at the venue. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And it's very difficult for people to get their heads wrapped around this. Yeah. Now, I, I did want to talk a little bit about, because uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time here, the Beatles. So when you were on James's show, you'd mentioned that the Beatles were a manufactured band. Yeah. It was music to my ears, no pun intended. And um, so... You were a, a a Beatle fan, yep. right? When you were younger, same same as I was. I was in the I call it, you know, I was in the cult, and then something happened. Like you know, uh, the light switch goes on, and you start to wake up to what's going on. And the Beatles, in my opinion, are just indicative of the industry itself. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for the Beatles, they are the most prominent band, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. In pop music. Yeah. And so when you start to talk about the Beatles not being who we were told the Beatles were, a lot of people get very upset. Very, very upset about it. Yeah. And it wasn't an easy thing for me to, uh, a, a pill for me to swallow, Mike, when I first got into the research. But uh, what, what are your thoughts about about the Beatles? Yeah, well, actually, some of your research, Mike, which I've seen... Um, and in particular, the four hour one you did on who wrote the songs was a, a, a shattering moment for me, really. And when I learned that the song Yesterday, that very famous Beatles song, um, actually originated in 1895 in an Italian aria. Um, and you know, it, it's not the lyrics, of course, it's, it's, but it's the, you can hear, it's, see the thing about the song yesterday, it's a brilliant little tune. It sets it up brilliantly. The phrase, it, it's, it's in F, so you play the chord of F and you play E minor, A7, D minor, and that melody that Paul sings, so it is, that's, that's, that gets you, that's the bit that works and sets you up for the whole song. And that's the exact bit that's in the Italian aria. Um, what I therefore thought was a stroke of genius from Paul turns out to be something else. And of course, Paul covers it with the story that he dreamt the song. Woke up one morning and there it was. So, so, so to me, I'd heard that story many, many times. And then when, when you revealed what you did in your presentation, I realised that's why he came up with that idea because if you'd really written that song you'd be telling everybody this is what i wrote and i came up with this i didn't sort of it didn't just appear overnight i don't know who gave it to me like it's a gift from heaven um so um and in looking into the rest of it i too have seen footage supposedly live footage of the beatles in in the 60s uh 62 63 64 around that period where the What's being played isn't matched by what's coming out. It's been overdubbed later. So they were doing, and, and this is the thing that really, why the Beatles are the apotheosis of the art of manufacturing something, and there must be a purpose behind the manufacture, is, is just to recognise there's so much footage of them from the very earliest time, photographs and film, in all sorts of places, all over in, in the studio, a candid stuff and all, apparently so, in taxis, in hotel rooms, in, in the early 60s. And this is film. People are walking around with cans of film. They get 15 minutes film, they have to change the film. You know, it's a massive, on somebody's part, somebody's organised all of that and said, we must capture all of this, we've got to capture all of this. Why would you do that? Once they've been successful, once they've been on the Ed Sullivan show or something, you think, okay, maybe, but this is prior to that. And um, and I always thought their arrival in America just a few months after Kennedy's assassination wasn't coincidental. There needed to be a distraction. Yeah. Yeah. American people were quite rightly 
and I'm seeing it now in the UK. Boris Johnson has just resigned. I hope that doesn't timestamp what we're doing here, might too much. But you know, and I'm wondering what's actually happening somewhere else. I should be looking over here somewhere, shouldn't I? <laughs> and um, so the Beatles, I can see from the beginning that this was so managed on every level to the extent that they filmed every step. Um, and I've tried to work out what the purpose was, apart from social engineering, we know about um, some of the things that have happened. I don't want to go in too deeply, but you know, uh, the breakup of certain family ideals, certain breakup, you know, some gender identity, a whole range of things was, was started back then and right. the seeds are being sown. But also, whenever the Beatles went anywhere, they went with an entourage, loads and loads of people, and they went with the backing of the Foreign Office, the UK Foreign Office and MI6, and the support and protection. And it suddenly occurred to me that they were a great cover for what else was going on, you know, wherever they were going. Um, our Secret Service were there, uh, un, un, you know, getting into things rifling through cabinets. I don't know what they were doing. But, you know, it strikes me that that, that was a certainly a, a reason to have all of that effort put into them. And also the songs, you know, once you are aware that yesterday didn't come from the Beatles, it came from somebody else, you then look at what, what else did. And obviously there's Bad Penny Blues for Lady Madonna. There's a whole range of other things, you know, and you can say, well, they didn't really invent that um, either. Yeah, anyway, I could rattle on. I don't mean to. And what I've noticed, Mike, is that the, the songwriting abilities from the Beatle era, from 1962 through 1970, all of that ability seemed to have it dissipated into, you know, when he went solo. In other words, John Lennon is credited with the song In My Life. Yeah. When do we hear anything even close yeah. to that? type of composition yeah. in his solo career my my answer is you don't no no don't. no 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 and and you know the let it be album which i think is the album where they did write all their own songs <laughs> is is to me very very substandard in every uh, regard it's ugly it's ugly in lots of ways apart from long and winding road uh, um, and a couple of others you know it's it's very ugly and i watched the three hours or was it six hours of a uh, get back yeah um oh, it's it's just very clear billy paul's replacement as we would say is talented was talented but fighting against the other beatles who weren't right much, much less talented so I, I can't yet factor that into the fab four you know, our, you know, you, you, we, we know what happened after 66, you get Sergeant Peppers and it, that's a whole new thing. Um, up until then, you know, the, the, the albums Revolver, Rubber Soul and it going back were OK. I, I, the one I liked least was Beatles for Sale, that's a rock and roll covers album, really. But when you really analyse how many great songs, most of them are McCartney. But you do have In My Life and you do have uh, a couple of the singles, I suppose, that might be John Lennon, supposedly. But it's, it's not, it's, I, can't, I can't say it because I hate to say it, but it's not all that good, you know. Some of it's yeah. pretty average. And I, I don't know what happened to him. Why, why George Harrison didn't want to play with the Paul McCarthy character in the in get it back you know why why it was awkward why john was off his head and didn't want to be there and but, uh, but they think ringo just ringo was just there yeah i know well he was just there yeah yeah so i think the the uh the get back documentary and the let it be film in general um actually is quite an eye-opener if you yeah. take a step back and you get away from the uh the admiring and the worship and all that and you take a look at what the initial objective was which was to write 14 brand new songs mm -hmm. within two weeks really yeah to do a concert and then that would become a television show and uh you know they ended up doing what uh five songs on a rooftop yeah and get back twice 
<laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So anyway, I don't want to beat it to death, but I just wanted to get your perspective on it because, like I said, you know, you are very uh, well equipped to mm -hmm. to observe and make a comment on yeah. uh, okay. on that stuff, you know. But I want to thank you so much, Mike, for coming on, having the conversation. It was a great conversation. I would love to have you come back anytime. Yeah. Like. I, 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 Mike, I'd love to do it. Thank you. I've seen you so many times in your presentation, so it's a bit like I know you already. I, <laughs> your face is so familiar. Anyway. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a real pleasure. And if you stick around, um, just after I, I end the, uh, the interview, Mike, I could just chit chat with you a little bit more. Yeah, of course. Okay. okay. Well, folks, that's it for, uh, for the show. And uh, again, thank you to Mike Stock for taking the time to come on to, uh, to talk to me. It's been a great interview, a lot of insights, and uh, I'll have the show up as quickly as I can. Thanks and have a great day.